next uh, uh, presenter in this uh, sequence is Ayush Sharma from Huawei Technologies. And uh, Ayush has a fascinating job, um, if uh, I was to think about it. He's leading a, a collection of over a th a th how many thousand? Many, 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 many uh, uh, designers and developers working uh, in open source and at various levels of a solution suite, um, all in favor of uh, building uh, open source solutions for service provider um, offerings. Uh, and has tremendous uh, experience managing some of the things Kelly was talking about, and uh, will share his thoughts with us in his talk. It's the, gr the green button. Sure. Thank you very much. Yep. Thank you, Paul, and uh, good morning to you all. So we have been historically, you know, um, as a vendor, historically we have been industrializing technologies like MPLS, um, you know, ATM, frame delay, 3G, 4G. Uh, so we, we had, had a good handle on how to industrialize those technologies. If I would be saying that you know, the same concept or with similar concept or similar approaches, you could industrialize SDN and FE using open source, I think that would be, that would be a lot of understatement and that would, be a, that would be a wrong statement to make. So utilizing open source, uh, you know, it, takes, it, it takes a lot of courage. It like, takes a lot of uh, cultural changes, as uh, some of my colleagues pointed out. And what I'm, in this context of the talk, I'm gonna share is in last two years of our experiences dealing with the uh, developments, dealing with the deployments, and dealing with the, those internal organizational and cultural changes. Uh, so what was, were our learnings from that? So last two years or so, we did about uh, you know, 60 plus proof of concepts ranging from a wide spectrum from mobility to data center, to the uh, transport networks, which includes both microwave and optical. Um, and this was with a variety of customers with the different use cases and the same use case with the different sort of uh, uh, permutations and combinations, et cetera. So we learned a lot from that. And the one thing which sort of you know, came out uh, was uh, the, there was common theme, uh, five common themes which we listed out was they all, in one or the other way, they want to go to that desired point of arrival. And what is that desired point of arrival is the you know, programmable, SDN-enabled, and virtual infrastructure. Now, moving from that point to this point, it, they need to do, undergo you know, a lot of changes. Traditionally, even vendors, as well as service providers, have been you know, deploying the products or developing the products in a very waterfall way, uh, fashion, right? So you go to standard bodies, and then after that, you follow this sort of engineering cycle, and after engineering cycle, you create those marvels, and those marvels which you sort of do a proof of concepts with your customers and generate certain business models, and you start going for, through the deployment, and then the next technology cycle comes, you uh, sort of package around the professional services, and then you design the networks again, and then you move from uh, X25 to frame relay, or frame relay to ATM, or ATM to MPLS, or, and so on and so forth, right? So these common themes which told us as a vendor uh, that we need to uh, change, and we need to embrace that change. And what that change means is that we have to change the way we develop the products. We have to change the way the waterfall works. We have to change the skill sets, uh, you know, what, what skill sets we need to gain during this process, right? So we also need to change the business model and the financial models, as Kelly also outlined a little bit in his talk. See, the other key component here was, is, the, is, the, is the approach to uh, you know, building the products, which is layer one to seven, you know, traditional, whether it's a router or a switch or a load balancer or a for, firewall, you gotta use this stack, and whether it's IP or TCP needs to be packaging, so we historically build the products with the, that using the OSI stack. If you go and look at the, in the last two or three years, uh, you know, the new paradigms entails the stack uh, being little different than the OSI stack. And utilizing the open source and looking at the open source innovations, what is happening in each of these layers, 
uh, not directly or indirectly mapping to those layers, uh, that throws a lot of challenge. That also uh, allows a place for the guards to kick in for the vendors like us. Now, if you don't have a sort of you know, that uh, skills, so typically what you're going to do is you're going to go to your comfort shell. So we're going to try to approach and build a new stack, which is the middle stack, in a historical way that we've been comfortable doing that. Right? So that is the NetOps way. That is the way how we build the internet by using ISIS, BGP traffic engineering, et cetera. So our approach would be still historical because we don't have that uh, expertise in-house. We don't have that thinking in place. We don't have that business model in place. We, we will, our product managers, our account managers, will not understand how to sell the software. And that also, I think, uh, both Tom and uh, Kelly also outlined a little bit in their talk. So the other sort of extreme is the open, or the free school, or the open school, right? So we, we always think that you know, the, it's, it's all rosy picture using the open source, where it'll be all faster. I sort of tend to disagree a little bit based on my experiences. I think having an extreme approach uh, does not help the community to foster that adoption. Uh, there is a, there is a uh, in my own opinion, uh, there, there is a goodness to all the 20 years of deployment experience which the carriers and the vendors have gone through, right? The products in the carrier networks have gone through several bug fixings. They have, it has been, uh, you know, building a carrier grade uh, SDN or building an enterprise grade SDN will have to go through certain characteristics. It would not be, although we want to leverage the data center economies, also we want to sort of bring those data center or cloud economies into the networking, but these two are different kind of networks and they have different high availability requirements. They have different security requirements. And if you place open source um, into, into or, or, or build an open source based product and straight away sort of, you know, uh, start putting into these networks, the implications are very high. Um, the implications in the putting that in the lab and trial versus putting a product are very high as a vendor as opposed to if you're using a community based, uh, you know, prototype or POC out there. So, Net net is there is a balanced approach. We have to leverage our learnings and best practices, what we have been doing, but at the same time, we don't have to go to uh, that extreme and trying to solve the problems exactly the same way as we have been doing, uh, which, which uh, I think it will, in the last uh, session, ONS uh, Guru highlighted that was a parallels of uh, uh, marginal thinking that we, we do the things historically what we have been comfortable doing that. So, so based on sort of those learnings from the customer experiences and also with this whole, uh, you know, brainstorming within the organization that we sort of uh, agreed that open source is vital for, for us to embrace, right? Uh, so principally, at very high level, everybody was sort of in a consensus mode that, yes, we need to embrace that change, but when we started listing out the changes, what we need to undergo, so then again, people were uncomfortable because uh, that requires us to change the, the skill set. That requires us to weigh, we build the products. And then two pillars, what we defined was open innovation and customer advocacy. And I will sort of get to it in a minute, like what we mean by open innovation and customer advocacy. Uh, that means that we bring the customer early into the R&D cycle. Now, if you start bringing customer into R&D cycle, uh, your engineers uh, who are in siloed or who've been developing the products in silos or been doing SIP testing or solution testing in silos, all of a sudden start getting requirements directly from the customer and then start to get, they do appreciate that, but they don't know how to handle that. There is no process in place how, to, how you deal with the customer's uh, live network problems, et cetera. So you have to undergo the cultural changes. You have to set it up the organization model in that way. Um, so. Taking that products out would also mean that you're investing for a longer period of time. Now, I think uh, the point Kelly made it out was the, you need to think that as a strategic investment. Uh, but if you make it too strategic in a large organization like ours, um, you know, we, 
we, we took a slightly different approach, although this is a strategic investment. But we also think that if you bring that incremental revenue opportunities, that gives the product managers and the account managers uh, an opportunity to look up to that, to that software-based model or services-based model, as opposed to thinking, you know, here is a strategic investment. We're going to uh, sort of invest a lot into the open community and continue to build sort of products by doing POCs and, uh, and trials. And then we're going to sort of, you know, um, in a couple of years from now, we'll start reaping in the benefits. So um, what the approach for our industrialization or our view or vendor's view of industrialization process was that we need to embrace open innovation, but in a meaningful way, right? So we, we will have to still build a carrier grade SDN. We will be still accountable. Uh, when we put our boxes in, in, uh, in a customer's uh, place, especially service providers, we'll be still accountable for the SLAs. I mean, we, there was a lot of talk, of course, in the industry about using white boxes and gray boxes, and I tend to sort of, you know, think it's a, it's a great change. Uh, but if your hardware comes from, let's say, a different vendor, and then your virtualization layer comes from another vendor, and the application from other, when there is a problem in the network, whom are you going to call? The support issues uh, around, the support model, and the services model uh, also need to be sort of thought through. And that ownership, and that to me is an also an opportunity for vendors like us to rethink how they what kind of products they have been building and what kind of products they should be building as they, where they bring their value propositions into the game and then sort of you know, work with the carriers to embrace that change and start deploying that changes, uh, so start deploying those, uh, uh, those new uh, networks or new boxes. So let me now be very specific to open innovation means different to different people. Uh, so what do we mean by open innovation? So what we sort of uh, define the goals of uh, open specifications need to convert into the code, and that code needs to be sort of validated by the customer use cases. And when it's validated, if it has a right business model and it has a product manager or account manager buy-in, buy then the chances of the success are much higher. I mean, if I use an analogy of IPv6 versus MPLS, why the adoption of one technology was faster than the other, that there was no sort of monetization direct service uh, sort of attached to the IPv6 technology. Whereas if you look at the MPLS VPNs, layer three VPNs or layer two VPNs, there was a, something worse carriers were looking forward to to serve to their customers and offer that services straight away. So sometimes the positioning and then revenue tied to that technology is also very, very important. So that's why we look at the taking the open specification, you know, taking, converting that into the code and, uh, and sort of you know, tying that revenue or business model to that and then start sort of making incremental money as opposed to looking for that point of arrival where you think everything is going to be hunky-dory. So uh, also there was another challenge that uh, you know, um, we have IETF. We have, uh, you know, we, we have uh, standards uh, bodies, right? So we have... Um, the standard bodies and, uh, and vendors and, and the uh, service provider communities, uh, more or less, they have been behaving in the same way uh, or similar way, I would say, that you, know, you go to the standard bodies, you, you define a buff, and then you, know, you, you go through that whole process, right? So if we continue to build these two silos that you define a standard or RFCs into ITF or 3GPP or other standards, and then you have another team which works on ONF and uh, defining protocol of obliv oblivious forwarding and, and, and layer four to layer seven, sort of, you know, uh, the, the specifications, et cetera. And when it comes to productization or when it comes to to, to running or converting that document into the code, how are, you gonna, how are you gonna make it happen? Because you have created a two different religious sort of technology, uh, technology forums within the company, right? So, so that's gonna be a very, very tough battle to do that. So we decided to put that saying, you know, create synergies between the traditional standards and open specification sort of uh, bodies, and then take that inputs uh, synchronize that input, uh, bring that synergy, convert that into the code, and utilize the 
the SDN Controller Consortium. Now, the SDN Controller Consortium, where we have invested in, is both ONOS and Open Daylight. And we chose, we cannot put all our resources to, to, to both the, the sort of controller consortiums. Uh, so quite candidly, the, the, the business sort of decision which were made was which architecture is suitable for which which uh, of our product lines. So we chose ONOS as our primary platform for carriers network because of the reasons what we think are more suitable for carrier networks in our, in our way of thinking. And uh, the, we chose Open Daylight as our primary platform for the enterprise and smart city and IoT uh, networks. And I'll get to it in a social proof what we have been doing and uh, what sort of products we are launching in uh, in uh, that's uh, that uh, utilizing both the controllers. So after the code has been developed, right? So we need a use case, and at, at, in the use case again, we go for the open NFE use cases, um, and then we go for the, uh, the, the where we follow also the Etsy architecture. So now, how the central office needs to be designed, and how we could use that code in a central office context with a let's say VCP, virtual BNG environment, or virtual OLT, and so on and so forth. Right. And then, last but not least, uh, you know, using those sort of you know uh, cloud and data center economies. So there is a certain tool set which has been uh, you know, made available to the community. So leveraging that tool set in uh, creating or in interfacing those APIs and, and, and sort of you know, building the stack, uh, the solution stack from bottom up. So now I'm just gonna go a little bit, drill, a little bit deeper into the each specific layer as to what specific things in the open innovation and in the specific planes we are doing and what are the learnings from those, right? So, so SDN data plane, I mean, there's been last four or five years, there's plenty of plethora of innovation and plethora of documents and, and a reasonable amount of code which has uh, come out in, uh, in, the, in the, both the controller consortiums. But what we have seen is there has been little which has been done in the forwarding plane. And if we need to generate those values very quickly as a, as a vendor, if we need to generate, and even for service providers, if they need to start offering this to their customers, so they need to start embracing uh, you know, the forwarding plane algorithms which are programmable, right? So, so we invested in P, uh, Puff very early on, three years back, but then later on quickly we realized there is a language called P4 which has, uh, which is, which is, which has a lot of strengths. And these were complementary. So what we decided, rather than just you know, um, putting a lot of emphasis on the puff, we thought, let's just uh, you know, marry these two, two technologies together or, and bring the sort of you know, strengths of puff into P4, and let's sort of you know, go with the uh, P4 rather than trying to create a multiple uh, you know, technology, sort of verticals or technology uh, teams within the open source body. So we went with that and we sort of uh, created something called uh, PIF and uh, also OFPI white paper, which will be available for the uh, later circulation as well. Now, let me talk about the IP. So this is the most difficult part where a vendor needs to go through, and we have gone through this, and it's not an easy thing. You also have to understand, you know, the pains and the challenges of that whole intellectual capital a vendor goes through in building that, right? So we have, you know, number one, we uh, market share in the access, number one, market share in the optical, number two in the IP, number two in the mobility, right? 30,000 patents in the last two years, right? And 170 plus, you know, uh, positions into the open standards and uh, in, the, in the open and traditional standard bodies. So if you have about so much of intellectual capital, you obviously, you will be, and you say, okay, I'm gonna give this and contribute to the community, automatically you will be challenged by many people within that groups, and this, I worked for three different vendors. The form of this and the magnitude was, too diff was different. But I think it was very common theme in, in my experience to deal with how do we let go our IP. And that's important is to, to just look at the business value, look at the use case, and look at the monetization opportunity uh, you know, 
down the horizon rather than playing a protectionism game because that's not going to serve us in the longer run, and that we realized. So we contributed our IP into the ONOS, which is layer 3 VPN, as well as on the optical side as well. Open daylight, right? So we also, in the control plane, we contributed a lot to open daylight um, project, both in terms of uh, uh, you know, specific projects like uh, uh, universal service channel, uh, which is the secure way to sort of you know, transfer the data from the device to the cloud, and it could be a sensor device like IoT to the cloud. And uh, from community point of view, and we actually launched our first commercial product based on Open Daylight. And we launched this in uh, three weeks back um, in, in Beijing. And we have a, one of uh, our biggest customer, we, we got a deal about you know, one, $1 billion plus deal to have those sensors and use the Agile controller, which is OD, Open Daylight base, and that uh, to me, is, is an incredible, incredible win within, within the community, incredible social proof within, the, within our company, incredible social proof within the community, uh, open source community, as well as towards our customers. So that also gives us enough confidence that if you're launching this product, you are going to fail. You're gonna go, going to fail faster, but uh, you know, you're going to also uh, succeed faster. So some uh, social proof again in the NFV, so we uh, put ONOS as uh, the project into the open NFV. Um, I would not go through the details of uh, on the application plane, how do we, we, we created uh, the, the sort of self-defending networks, but that also gives an example of uh, you know, how we can create application and leverage the new values with that. Uh, combining this, um, uh, this with the customer advocacy and open innovation using access network and central office. We do have a, we do have a, uh, a demo here, and we would like, we will, I will urge you to have a look at the demo for more details, uh, but this demo, uh, what, what it illustrates is, is the use of layer three VPN using the virtual CPE in an environment which is central office or new central office using the open source controller, giving way to the new values like analytics. So some final thoughts. Um, the, the changes, sort of what we had to undergo are four C's, or I'll say the four C lessons, what we have learned out of that was basically, first thing, what you have to think through is the commitment. So executive level and engineering level commitment is needed to get this succeed, uh, to, to go to, to a successful point. Um, you need a cultural change. I think uh, my colleagues, uh, you know, talk a lot about, industry colleagues lot, talk a lot about the cultural changes, what you need to undergo. Um, the cash cow, right? So your cash uh, business models are changing from the products to the software and services. But last but not least, bringing R&D closer to the customer. So using those specific cases, putting that early on into the, into the products, and as I said, fail fast, but succeed faster. So with that, uh, thank you very much. I'm looking forward for the productive Q&A. Thanks. Super, thank you, Ari.